Being, my, my background's in uh, a degree in uh, English language literature before I did a PhD. And so my background's in uh, text and uh, stuff like that. So we all that But um, I looked up the definition of research uh, in a Chambers dictionary, and it gave this first definition, which I really, really like. It's from an 18th century definition of research. It's now obsolete as a definition, and it was particularly applied to music. And research was defined in music as the seeking of patterns of harmony, which, once found, can be used in a piece to be played afterwards. Now, the reason I like that definition, I hope it will chime with whatever you're doing. For me, it chimes with all sorts of different disciplines. Because the key, the first four words for me are absolutely key, the seeking of whether, whether you are gathering empirical data, uh, whether you're doing a review of literature, uh, whether you're doing historical research, business research, scientific research, healthcare research, you're always seeking a pattern. Uh, and the analysis of your data is about pattern often seeking in some form. And I guess that um, what you're seeking a pattern for is in order to understand or bring a new perspective, see a new pattern in data or in existing literature that hasn't been no seen before. Um, in terms of music, the seeking of patterns of harmony. I'll come, I'll come back to that in a minute. That's just a specific to music. I like it though, because harmony in my own field, uh, literature, language, linguistics, and so on, uh, means um, unity. Aesthetic design, uh, a sort of good shape and piece, which once found, I like this even more because it's very Anglia Ruskin, this next bit, once found can be used in the piece to be played afterwards. But if we go back to the, the musical definition, so the music or musician is seeking the patterns of harmony once he or she's got them can use those to inform their playing of the piece, whether it's a quartet or whatever piece of music it is. In other words, the research informs the practice, the actual performance. Uh, but I think that for any of our research, uh, whatever you're doing, once you've found it, can it be used in the piece to be played afterwards, as if you're in the real world, in performance, in a project, uh, in changing practice, in making a difference to the world? That's why I say it's a good angle of Ruskin thing for me, because I really like the fact that research here is very much about making a difference. Okay, so there's the definition. Um, by the way, there's, there's another definition I haven't put up there, also from the 18th century, which sort of amuses me, which is that research also meant at that time to seek a partner in love or marriage. I think that's a really funny definition. <laughs> love or marriage, that seems like a really hard one. Uh, but anyway, um, seeking a partner. That's what research meant. So you, you've all got to be very careful when people ask you about your research. <laughs> if you say, can I research you, you if you mind. In the 18th century, it meant, you know, can I, can I be your partner? Um, but research, just before I come on to more technical academic side, it has meaning, of course it does, in, um, in contemporary everyday life. My eight-year-old, when we moved to St. Albans, she went to the school, doing a project on the moment, so I happened at the same time to uh, get uh, my first professorship at Middlesex University. So she was saying, Dad, this job you know, that you're doing, I'm doing the same thing. She said, I'm researching the Romans for my school project. And sure enough, she's using a lot of the skills that you all and, and I have used, which is sifting, finding out, putting stuff together, Thinking about it, looking for gaps in the research, etc., uh, etc. Et so that that process is, is just not what we do. It's a general process. Children do it. Of course, other other industry does it, and so on and so on. And just this week, it's a bit of a sad story actually. Uh, but over the last four weeks, my uh, youngest daughter, who's now 22, just got her first part as an actress. Her first. Uh, Auditioned and paid part, she thought, 
in an all female heavy lift lift that is going to go on at the Water Release Theatre in London. Very exciting. Uh, what she's been doing in the last six weeks, the director asked her to research her part, to find out about women in war right across the world, because that's going to inform the action that you as an actor, in heavy lift lift as a female actor, uh, are going to draw, need to do. You need to do the research to understand how to play the part. But of course, doing the research gives you a sense of ownership. Um, it's more than learning. It's, I'll come back to it. For me, research is cutting edge now. It really goes to trying to find out these things. So, I think research is, uh, uh, can I use this? Is it just, it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Better this In terms of academic research, uh, well, Maybe this will ring well to you. I think, I think in talking about my journey and journeys through the PhDs and beyond, um, I just want to think about starting points, then I'll, then I'll start the journey. I think research starts in different ways, and I'm sure you've all got your own story to tell. This, it could start with a problem, and it's an intellectual or practical problem. Um, it could start with a research question, and often in the arts, social sciences, uh, history often starts that way. Uh, they can often at the very beginning, I'll demonstrate this visually in a minute. I'm sure you found a research question a bit vague in general, maybe too large, and it's a process of sort of sharpening down to a very good start. Or it can start, as it often does in the sciences, with a hypothesis, which can start as a hunch, or derive from a problem, or a research question. In fact, you can have all three of these at the beginning of the research, but often, as actual starting points for the design of the research, and stated at the beginning of the thesis, it's usually one of these that's foreground to actually give you a clear But here's um, a diagram I'll come back to. I just want to take you through in terms of journey and story. Um, this uh, happens to be a depiction from 1 to 5 and 6 to 10, so from 1 to 10, of a, a journey uh, in Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism. Um, wh why did I choose that? Well, uh, I, I've actually spent time in Zen monastery. In my youth in the 1970s, it was great. And I've always been fascinated by it. I visited temples in Japan and uh, some, some, some funny stories uh, around that. Um, most recently, actually, uh, I was in China visiting um, the University of Xi'an, XIAN. And the dean who had, uh, I was the dean at the time, this was last, last year. Um, and the dean who'd invited me said, What were your particular interests? And I said, uh, oh, I, I like walking, you know, uh, stuff like that. She said, okay, we'll do a day walking. So she took me to the nearest mountain to the university, which is the sixth highest mountain in China. Uh, it's called Hanshan. And um, it's six and a half thousand feet. Okay? So we took a cable car up to about one and a half thousand feet. So she's got 5,000 to go. And she was just had her handbag, some sort of day shoes uh, on, and um, you know, I had just, I was just, just put like this, and, um, and we started climbing this mountain. Well, the nice thing about the mountain that connects with this is that there were a lot of Taoist tea shops and temples on my arm, as there are in Chinese temples. So very poetic, very, very beautiful. Um, but just to tell you this story, um, when we got to about 5,000 feet, that's quite a climb. It, the, the path got narrower and narrower, and on either side there was about a thousand foot drop, just a chain um, helping us to kind of climb up. And I, actually, I've never been, I've climbed a few months now, I've never been so petrified. <laughs> she was kind of sailing on. Uh, but I, I said to her, I think that only vice chancellors and presidents should go to the top of the mountain. <laughs> The deans should stop at 5,000 feet <laughs> as appropriate and then turn around. And she 
Do you know that was not very funny, but it's sort of, it's, uh, it's sort of sense of humor. And she turned around, and, and then it got even more precarious because walking down a mountain, as you know, is even harder. I really thought we were going to pick and finish there. So the trouble is, next time I go, I'll have to go higher up the mountain. That's the <laughs> but anyway, that's a bit of a sideline. It just shows my interest in, in uh, Buddhism and Taoism and so on. But here's the story. This is a Japanese uh, wood prince. So Give you the reference later. Uh, Woodblock Prince. And it tells the story of um, a young boy seeking enlightenment. Okay? And for me, when, when I saw this, I thought, okay, this is a lovely depiction of the stages of enlightenment. But it's also an incredible, for me, lovely research process. Let me just take you through it in terms of a research journey. To begin with, the boy wanders in nature, not knowing what he's looking for but generally looking around and searching. Stage two, he sees tracks that he thinks, I must follow these. Okay? Just think of your own research project, see if it works with this. He sees tracks and begins to pursue them. In the third image, he sees the object that he wishes to capture and sort of uh, understand and control. And it's the back end of an ox, right? In the fourth image, he captures the ox. Now, it, in, the, in this story, in this sort of Zen uh, story, that signifies the capturing and harnessing of the power of nature. Okay. In the fifth a uh, little woodcut, he has controlled and captured and got command of nature, uh, or we can say knowledge, I suppose. And he brings the ox, who's now tamed, back to his little hut. In fact, not only has he tamed it, he's riding on top of it and playing uh, on the field, so um, much in command of his field, as it were, he is. When he gets back to his hut, he um, sort of the, the ox is gone, and he's just sitting, contemplating, reflecting on his journey so far. And in this eighth one, typically Zen Buddhist, there's nothing. That that sort of indicates enlightenment. He is erased completely. He's not there anymore. Nothing is there. Only the uh, understanding, the wisdom. That he's there. But here's the, um, here's the wonderful bit. It doesn't just stop there, because he then understands that he is part of nature, but invisible. Element. In fact, his identity is now immersed in the sort of landscape he was originally uh, seeking for, but was a, a separate <coughs> being, as it were. He's now completely immersed in it. Now. And then, even better, in the very final one, he takes his wares to in other words, he takes what he has learned and trades it in the everyday world. He, he returns to the world. Um, so I think that that journey in uh, Zen Buddhism is it is, it's a very common word, story within Asia. Uh, this is just the Japanese version. Is uh, very akin to what it is like to do uh, a research project. I'll just go through it quickly. First of all, you're not quite sure what you're looking for, but then get a hunch and track. You follow it, okay, you begin to see what it is you're after. You capture it, tame it, get on top of it. Uh, you, I love this one, which is sort of release somehow because you can understand that the spirit is playing through the flute. You, you then reflect on what you've gained, the knowledge you've gained, uh, the new knowledge you've created, <coughs> the process perhaps also, and that gives you the understanding. Thesis then. That's the thesis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, yeah, the thesis is submitted here. <laughs> it's worth, the thesis itself, such a material object. But it's actually about, uh, yeah, that, that is the key one, isn't it? <laughs> and then uh, after that, you're, you're sort of released from it. You're released from the work, you pass through it. It's a stage of wheat, it's a little massage, and like a skin you shed, and then you enter the world. 
integral. You may have redesigned it as a product, you could make it as a module, uh, you could make a talk, you give a conferences, but your outcome is really Interestingly, no people appear until development. This is always the end of the picture. Anyway, uh, I like that, but I thought that sort of, in a sense, is shaped by Joe. I'm not quite sure where I am on the cards. Let, let me just talk about my own research now, a bit autobiographical. Well, I had an idea um, uh, in, I guess this started in the early 60s, which kind of shows how old I am. But um, I really wanted to do, I, I'll tell you how it started. I was interested to be in the rhythm, okay, uh, in the rock and jazz music of the time. So yeah, I, won't, I won't embarrass myself if I go too far into this. I was particularly interested in a Latin American band called uh, Santana, who played a good song. Because the rhythms they brought to Western music were so various, so uh, interesting. It wasn't just the straight blues for me, it was very complex and interesting. And I thought, wow, how do you account for those? So, just my field's literature, I thought, in free verse, which is verse that's unrhymed, apparently unstructured, um, how do you account for the rhythm? Uh, I registered for a PhD at the University of York. I did a year's work, but I didn't go any further. My supervisor said to me, this sort of killed it off. Said to me, you've got the island of islands. That is the gathered. I, I gathered music, I gathered various records of different things. And he said, you've got the iron findings, but where's the magnet? Really challenging question, actually. Like, what's giving shape to this? Um, and I really didn't have an answer for it at that point, because I think I was at too early a stage. I still think I was just you know, gathering the soup in. It was too early for me to answer. That was even after a year. Anyway, I didn't do it then. Uh, funnily enough, it's just resurfaced uh, 40, 50 years later in a book proposal that I've just um, got to write a book about this. And I've been thinking about it for 50 years. So uh, I'm really looking forward at some point to kind of sitting down and trying to write that prosody, which is an account of the rhythms of the rhythms. However, the actual topic of my PhD arose uh, from an interest in argument. Um, now, what have I got 1950s there? Um, uh, argument in, in British culture, I'd say the English culture, I should say, is often thought of as a bad thing. Um, indeed, I think I got started to get interested in it when, um, as a child, my parents would occasionally uh, argue in the kitchen and shut the door, leaving my brother and I outside because they both didn't want us to see what was going on. Or you didn't want us to hear it, but of course you could hear it through the kitchen door. So I particularly got really fascinated. I guess I was also subconsciously worried. I didn't know quite what was going on. So then argue, but then they come out of the kitchen and it looks like everything was okay. So I thought, this is a strange social process. I'm not allowed to see it. But it's obviously happens in my parents' life. I mean, they're still around my parents. So they were sort of happily married. It wasn't a disaster. Uh, but um, argumentation, one, of the, one great philosopher, Habermas, has said, I won't go into detail on this, has said, uh, it's a means by which we uh, reach agreement and consensus in order to take action in the world. I, I, yeah, whether it's in Parliament, in everyday life, uh, in academia, it's, it's a really prized thing. Anyway, that, I guess I was interested in it from a child. And then um, in my last year as a school teacher, 1987, I got a little study uh, to spend half a day a week, which is a gold dust to a teacher in school, uh, half a day a week to examine argument across the curriculum in history, mathematics, and English. Um, and that's when I, I began to get really interested. I wrote a short report for the school. In mathematics, not my field. Um, the mathematicians are still with me. Said to me, "Well, the argument in mathematics," they said, "is either side of the equal to power. Whatever's on one side of the equal to power is balanced by an argument on the other side of the equal to power." 
more of this business than just my own interest. And historians said, it's the discipline. In history, that's what we do. We begin with sift evidence, we dig down from tertiary level textbooks to secondary level, and to books to primary evidence. And the words are right and wrong. So I thought, okay, this is more interesting than I thought it was. And after that, uh, in my next year, I got a job as a lecturer uh, at the University of Harvard. I taught in um, English in three schools in the UK, all comprehensive schools, and in an international school in Hong Kong. And I, I was just saying to Ross when I came in, um, in those days, you sort of didn't have to have a PhD to get a university job. This was a job in the School of Education, as a lecturer in English education. But I had, I guess I had published in that day. Of the 80s. The first book I did was a book for kids in school about editing, which I co wrote with a sub editor on the Observer newspaper on the book from Rocket Bus. And uh, I also, when I was in Hong Kong, edited an international poetry anthology with another fellow teacher. So I guess I had a little bit of a public publishing record. I've written a few articles and a few other things. And I guess that's what. Looking back and trying to, I hope this doesn't sound immodest, maybe that's what got me the job uh, as well as you know, the training of English teachers. But as soon as I embarked, the university said you ought to register for a PhD. <coughs> so, uh, and I did, building on that experience in the last year uh, at, as a school teacher, I thought, okay, I'll start a PhD, not to the same. And I did it on roughly what is the relationship between narrative, storytelling, stories, printing stories, writing stories, and argumentative structure in the writing of 12 and 14 minutes. And it arose, it wasn't just my question, because uh, I realized reading a few reports around the time that there was a widely perceived problem in education at that time uh, that 11 year olds and It was this, if you like, the decade of narrative. It was, uh, it was a fantastic decade of celebrating narrative, but it didn't really equip uh, young people with the argumentative oral skills, you know, to, to speak and listen to them, but also the written skills, which we all know in academia are absolutely essential. You know, the, the best piece of work in academia are really well argued pieces. It's like a hidden criteria. So it arose from a, a, a wide obscene problem. Just very briefly, I undertook it with a sample from year eight. Uh, that's actually, uh, yeah, year eight. You'll hand out, I just made a mistake, it wasn't year nine, it's year eight in all three secondary schools in Devon, where I lived at the time. And actually, do still live in East Yorkshire. Um, so I had three schools uh, a girls' school, a boys' school, and a mixed comprehensive. So I had a good sort of uh, population to deal with of uh, year eight, that's 12, 14 year olds. I think there must have been about three or five hundred 12 to 13 year olds in the town at that point. And you know, I, so I did a, a sample and a half. Started in 87, finished in 92. Now, um, so it took me five years, part time, for doing a full time job. So the only time I could do it was in the and I don't know if this, again, recalls of your experience, but if you only have two hours in an evening, right? I remember this period so clearly in my life. We had two small children and a baby, a third one, on the way, after 22 years. Old. So, um, and I asked my wife, I said, what, what was it like in that period when I was doing my PhD? And she kind of looked at me as if she'd been buried some deep, Zephyr <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> he said, Well, you know, I mean, you just went off and did your PhD, you know, and I was you know, cleaning up the house and making sure the bed and keeping the children happy. And, well, I tried to read two articles at the time. So I, did, I do remember very strongly thinking it's eight o'clock, the children have got to go to bed, so I've got to do a couple of hours of this PhD. And 
even when they got into their twenties, they still like they're picking his head in the book. Why are you invent that? Because I got into such a, a rhythm over those five years. But again, with only two hours, or at least one and a half hours, in a fairly tired state, there's only so much you can do. I, I, I figured that at different times in the PhD, I concentrated in different ways. And I still do, actually. I don't think I'm going to relax. So in two hours, I could read a couple of articles, make notes on the index cards as I did then, uh, you know, do a bit of compiling, stuff like that. It's all, shall we say, reading and noting. And it, wasn't, it wasn't actually writing. Because I found later that to write it, I needed much more space and time. Not only to do the writing, but to get into the writing, you know, to clear my desk, to fiddle around, to get the papers in the right place, um, do a bit of you know, displacement activity before actually writing. As soon as I got into the writing, the concentration was huge. And like nothing I've ever written since, because I wasn't actually writing for an audience. The only audience for the front page to were the two examiners. I didn't even know they were there. And I said, I didn't expect anyone else to read it. So, um, so I worked away. Uh, very different to writing a book or writing an article where you know you want to communicate to someone. Maybe that was just my own hang up, but I found, because I didn't think of an audience particularly, I was, it was the material I wanted to uh, do justice to. That's really what I saw the act of writing doing justice to the material, to the ideas, to the data I gathered, to the kids I worked with, my, my participants, and so on and so on. I have to say also that when it came to my Viber, um, PhD Viber, in 1992, as a member of staff, you have two external uh, examples. And I sat in my room, I'd been working there for five years already, so I sat in my office, and I knew the Bible was at night go to the morning, and that one of the um, examiners was probably the preeminent social linguist in the world, Clinton uh, Press. Don't you know him? He works at the Institute of Education. Um, now a colleague of mine has just met him. And um, I was sort of petrified, you know, because even more so when the head of the department came up and said, oh, the examiners need an extra half hour. Do you mind just waiting? You know, we'll call you when what do you do in a half hour? I kind of swept to kind of dust the shelves off if I couldn't concentrate on anything. Sat by my computer waiting for an email to come in. I've never done that before. I'm just sitting there hoping somebody would come in to distract me. But anyway, I went into the Viber. Uh, it, it turned out to be a really um, demanding but civilized conversation. I was very lucky. I went on I was on my toes the whole way through. Anyway, luckily I got it uh, with a few minor corrections, which took me about half a day to do. Uh, and here it is. Yeah, I've uh, I brought it along with me. I printed it on really thick paper because I thought that would give it a kind of a weighty feel. But it has some photographs here which I used as, uh, to stimulate my teams. Uh, and it was done on an Amstrad computer, which is one of the early, uh, early computers. Yeah. Say, we'll say more about that later. So there you go, I did the PhD. Uh, but what did I do? Ross has really stimulated me in thinking about this. What did I do during the PhD, not afterwards? Because while I was doing it, I was doing other things. So I thought, actually, I'm really interested in the rich between narrative and argument. So what I proposed to open here is that I edit a book on narrative and argument. Um, and uh, I did that, and you know, part of me felt actually it's going to give me some good material for my thesis. But uh, I think this, yeah, this was finished before this was published, you know, in the middle of, of doing it. And because it was an editing, editing piece of work, it didn't really take up the same sort of concentration in part of my mind that my thesis was. Um, I also wrote, wrote another book during that called uh, The Problem of Poetry, which was about rhythm, that thing I talked about earlier. But that was totally separate from my research. And it was, a different, as I say, a different kind of writing, so it felt different to be doing that. As I said, um, I 
goes to the hot time, goes to the evenings, the environment we were just talking about. Uh, I started applying for postdoctoral research grants while doing the, the doctorate. I'm not so sure you can do that so easily these days. I think I'm sort of running, because the doctorate was framed by a specific focus, I knew that the field was wider than just the bit I was doing. So I thought, mm, there are things in the field I could do here. But maybe I'm not going to do the thesis, but are interesting. Let me just you know, go to a research grant. Although after writing the PhD, after that period of concentration, I felt I couldn't give up. I just didn't want to get the way near it. Because I guess it'd be such a, it's a long period of concentration. Um, yep. And uh, I was very lucky, actually. And I think this has partly defined my career. It, just to think about the professional side, because during that period of doing the PhD, I won a grant for research in the teaching model in the schools, and there's a Bevan Trust, and the Levy Trust grant for research in the teaching model in six forms of universities. I was interested in the interface between a six form and the Levy University, and what sort of kinds of I required to do. And after the PhD, Incorporating all of the PhD work, published a book in 1995 called Teaching the But right, as I said, writing a thesis is very, they're probably the same length as a book, actually. Maybe because the paper is thicker, but it's probably the same number of pages, same number of words. But writing a book for me was much more uh, free. Like, that's the only way I could because I've done the research, I sort of knew what I wanted to say, did it chapter by chapter, and I was thinking, I want this to be of use to six formers or teachers or academics. It just went much faster. Um, so that was immediately during uh, at the end of the PhD. And then um, I guess that. What I did with the research on narrative argument is in those years from, I got a PhD in 92, from 93 to 95, I started to do bits of writing. And some of them, I, I've always mixed it up a bit. So some of them, this is just a four page uh, piece in a professional journal, the English Media Magazine, which I really like, like that magazine a lot, so I wanted to write them. Uh, this was a more uh, like a critical piece about the new national curriculum at the time, which made a distinction between chronological and non-chronological writing. And I thought, in my work on narrative and argument, I knew that narratives could be both chronological or they could be non-chronological. You can tell a story, you don't have to tell it in chronological order. Uh, and equally, not all argument is non-chronological. Some arguments are chronological. So, I thought they were making too crude a distinction in the national curriculum, and so wrote an article in an in a, uh, academic journal, and then another one in an academic journal, uh, another one, and then I, I, I realized that the field I was working in, argument, was absolutely critical to democracies. In, in, in Turing's, you don't argue. You are told what to do. You, know, you don't have a voice. In democracies, they're difficult because you have to argue the crowd not to them. That's what parliaments are about, uh, policy is about, and so on. And luckily, I won an award in Chicago for that article, the American Society of Policy was about democracy. But, um, but it was about how important an argument was to democracy. And then I broadened the field again into rhetoric, uh, which I was interest in that vain rhetoric I basically think of as the arts of discourse um, sort of uh, if you like political literary work and uh, everything from everyday life and bringing those out from milk man or woman uh, to a conversation on the street all the way through to political speeches literature uh, and education stuff and so on okay. oh yeah and I went to conference I started going to conferences so uh, every four years, but like the World Cup or the Olympics in argument was at the University of Amsterdam. So every four years, I went to that conference and just gave a paper, 
And of course, I met a lot of people uh, in the field, which was which was great. Plus, I enjoy I, I discovered Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, anyway, then. Do you want me to talk about this, Ross? About my job, see how it. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, well, professionally. So, so I started, as I said, this lecture job at University of Hull, um, without a PhD. But by the time I left there in '94, yeah, I got a senior lectureship, and I'd set up a Center for Studies in Rhetoric and a Center for International Literature. I, well, I also ended up chairing the research committee. But I guess I was just interested in research, so I just put myself forward for this, for this. I think I got a professorship at Middlesex, a place I really loved working, it's so creative, it's a bit like Anglican Ruskin. Um, partly because I had the PhD by then, and I had two research grants, and some academic publications, and that, I suppose, I kind of Guessing, maybe they you know, thought that was good. That was for four years. And then I went back to Hull uh, very briefly and then got a professorship uh, in English education at the University of York. Okay. Um, I can certainly answer questions about all these. And then more recently, uh, I've been, uh, well, I had the opportunity in 2007 to. This was tied up with the Research Excellence Program because um, the Institute of Education were hiring, but it was almost like um, trying to hire researchers that would be good for the OBF program. And at the very, on the very last day where you could transfer, it's a bit like a football transfer, I was interviewed and, uh, in the afternoon and then told I got the job at the Institute of Education about 7 o'clock in the evening. And then the director said, and here's, I said, I'm supposed to resign from my current job by midnight. And he said, here's a laptop, resign. <laughs> you know, just do it. And um, I got into trouble again with my wife from that one. <laughs> I did a consultant before taking this job. That was a bit funny. Anyway, it was great working at the, I loved working at all the universities I worked at, actually, but the Institute of Education is terrific. It's just now merging uh, next month with UCI. But now, um, I was delighted to come here because, um, for me, uh, Anglia Ruskin is one of, it's not an old university, it's 20, 25 years old, but it has that exciting edge between research and innovation, and it's a real world application that I've talked about. Before. Some of the things that go on for the research are just fantastic. I'll, I'll just cite one thing. Rob Twisson, Director of Code, the Center uh, for Center Cultures of the Digital Economy, has just launched in this last, this year, the first album on app worldwide. It's not in any other format. It's just an app. It's done that with a French group, and then it just happens up the corridor. So it's amazing what goes on here in terms of research. And for me, whereas most research, most research I do is after the event, Pouring over the entrails or the endings of activity or our own PhD and trying to look at what happens and understand what's going on. A lot of researchers are um, working, the phrase I use is upstream of action. But they're doing research in order to improve practice. Uh, that Rob is an example of that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I won't bore you with that. I've given you the references, but I've I keep trying to get away from argument as a field. I thought, I mean, it would be good to get away from it, but I keep coming back to it. Uh, and I've done it for a few books that stand up before you in those. Um, and where now? Well, um, the, it's a really good time uh, for me to join the Kingdom of uh, both for myself, uh, it's, it's a, real, a real new challenge for me, but also to help you build the research culture here. Yeah, you're all really important. Um, I think that what we need to do now, we've already kind of got a trajectory at Anglo Ruskin that's going up in research. It's becoming much more of a research actor, research and teaching university than a 
teaching with my colleagues, academic school, <coughs> and you, if you're interested in these, we've got to go for research grants, opportunities, uh, raise the profile of Andrew Ruskin, and you'll find out next month where we stand in the recent this research excellence framework, uh, 2018. The next one's probably in 2020. So uh, I guess my job is the next six years, you know, as opposed to the last six. But so I'm really interested to see what the results are. Next month. Uh, to build more scholarships and studentships for research students, uh, to look and build more postdoctoral opportunities, uh, to support research students uh, as best I can. And one, one thing that has always been the case here, I see no reason why we can't collaborate with English University of Auckland. We do. We already do with some respects of Anglo Ruskin, um, and with partners in the UK uh, and worldwide. I think throughout my whole career, partnerships and collaboration, from the joint book with the editor of the Observer to um, collaborations with artists and other bits of work, there have always been really important stimulants. So I think we celebrate collaboration in order to solve the problem uh, in our field. We'll say much more about all these uh, as we go along. And on the innovation side, um, well, we are already, we've already got a very strong profile in the region. And Cambridge University has an interest largely in the 20 mile radius of the region, if it's got science cars, biome, etc. But we have an interest in Cambridge itself. And later this afternoon, I've got a call of the leader of Cambridge City Council, and that's to link us as a university with Tianjin. Sort of thing that we try to help build. We've got an interest in Cambridge too, but we also have a regional interest across the whole region, which Cambridge University has a bit less of an interest in. And they are very good nationally, in that, you know, uh, and we need to be stronger nationally. And we both have an interest in the international and global world. Um, local enterprise partnerships are about building inward investment into the region, jobs, new industry, making ideas into realities. Ixion is our subsidiary company interested in getting people back into employment, long-term unemployed and disabled people. CBIS, the Confederation of British Industry, which is really interesting body actually, thinking about housing and transport and people so and sort of jobs. And we have a medical technical campus uh, that's been created also a business innovation center, MedDig. Not only for medical uh, technologies, but all the implement technologies that can be transferred. Much of our work is in knowledge transfer and innovation. And these, these acronyms at the bottom are our, our research institutes. The Cultures of the Digital Economy, Global Sustainability Institute, the new Anglo-Ruskin Institute for uh, no, information, information Technology Institute. The International Institute for Management Practice, the Veteran and Families Institute, and the Postgraduate Institute. Those are our sort of showcase research institutes. One of the child of one has been disbanded, apparently. Yeah, yeah, so I can't take the blame for any of this yet. <laughs> yeah, so it's all in this time. Okay, so I think there's lots to do on the innovation side, and I'll just finish with this slide, which for me shows, first of all, that research is a field in itself, and so is innovation, but of course got a lot of overlap. This Venn diagram, that's about the knowledge transfer, and it actually goes both ways, not just from research to innovation, but new innovations can, can bring about new activities. Let's say, um, well, take the internet uh, as an innovation, that's transformed social practice. So there's things to research. And I've always wanted to keep teaching, supervision, and mentoring close to these, uh, because for me, a great university has research and teaching working together and bouncing off each other all the time. I, I like uh, being taught by people who are researching, because they, they're at the cutting edge of their own uh, They're not, D.H. Uh, Lawrence has a wonderful phrase, 
Holy Spirit Center. He who learns from uh, from someone who has learned all there is to know, drinks from a stone in a pool. But he who learns from one who is still there, <coughs> drinks from a running stream. That's a great insight into a theory of learning and teaching. So if you are researching, you're at the cutting edge of your learning. That's the key thing. That's at the core of all of these, I think. And research for me, as I said earlier, is cutting edge learning. It's, re it's learning on the edge. Okay, there's some references, just for reference. Uh, there's some more references. So I'll just say that. There's the yeah, yeah, right. <coughs> um, what I found that after I finished this, and sort of tried to walk away from it for a while. Um, what I found the most useful piece of work to keep going back to was the bibliography. Because it was, you know, we all do a pretty extensive set of references of bibliography book and pieces. And I still go back to it uh, because it was fairly extensive. Uh, and I've got a list of two bibliography and so on. Um, I've also brought along, I won't say too much about it, uh, an example of a thesis I'm supervised, which is called the emergence of study manga in Japan. It's cited at the University of York. With a, uh, there's a Japanese woman who had been a Cafe Pacific air hostess, decided she had enough of air hostess and wanted to do a PhD. And she started looking at manga, the Japanese cartoons, as an educational tool, but got so interested in the history of them. And what this is is a, a beautiful coffee table quality thesis with high production imaging all the way through with annotations in three forms of Japanese as well as English. Uh, and it's just a, a, a brilliant piece of work. Um, a really interesting story uh, in this one, and I'll, I'll finish in two minutes, was that as I read the final draft of this as a supervisor, I said to her, I think you need to make your research question a bit more explicit here at the beginning. So that the examiner, when you're reading, will know exactly what it is you're, you're trying to do. And she said, uh, she said, she said I can't do that. She said, for some Japanese culture, it's not good to make anything too explicit. And my a supervisor, I got really worried about that. Because I thought, oh dear. She said, it is better in Japanese culture to not say what they're doing, but to gradually seduce the reader through the thesis, and maybe not even say it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I nearly died. <laughs> in my Western sort of thing, of you must be explicit about your research question, you know, because the examiner is going to judge you against that. Um, we found a sort of compromise, but uh, she didn't want to go the whole way by any means. She, she thought it was rude, actually, to be so explicit. I now understand Japanese culture a lot more because we've been just, just, and also the whole culture of seduction in Japanese. Not that she was seducing me, but <laughs> the, the culture of seduction in Japanese of, you know, of hiding things and leading someone down a path that's a very, very interesting. It increases to us. And then, well, this one, and of course, PhDs take, can take digital PDFs, so they can swallow. More translate than this. I'm revising the regulations oh, okay. in, in the spring. Yeah. But the um, uh, this is another brilliant PhD. It happens to be uh, by someone from London Metropolitan University, uh, and it's uh, looking at archives that were lodged in Miami, Florida, on a map for a Cuban writer and collector of uh, old folk tales. Uh, you can't see this. I have time, I'll show you the DVD. On the DVD are, are stacks of files and boxes. She has translated all this into a, I presented a thesis actually uh, in this, this is it. This is what was presented for examination. You put it in a computer, and up comes a, an interactive desktop, which is her desk. And her desk has about 10 hotspots on it. And you just click on them, and up comes her notebooks, Story sheet, 
separate folders. Maybe I'll do. Can I have that? We could try. We could try. And um, uh, as well as the whole conventional thesis itself, uh, which is on, you know, it's hard to describe it, but it's a brilliant, um, great piece of work. And just to finish off, um, here are the two books I did work on. But yeah, I also got interested in the dissertation and the doctoral thesis, uh, as well as the master's thesis themselves. And edited a couple of years ago with some uh, colleagues at different universities um, Eric Borg from Coventry University, a typographer, Stephen Boyd Davis, who's now at the Royal College of Art, director of research, Mir Domingo from New York University, and Julian Wolf, head of social science at Coventry Library. We did a book on the changing nature of dissertation uh, in the 21st century, uh, of which this is an example. And, um, and I agree with you. It all depends on regulations. You're absolutely right. What you're able and allowed to do in your university, so you should check them very carefully. But yeah, uh, nowadays, all the disciplines are learning from the arts in that yes. you can, you can, yeah, that's it. You can include film, sound, uh, and so on. In, in your dissertation, in the main body of the dissertation. Great, what the I'll show you this. It is fantastic. So if you just give me two more minutes, then we're going to just show you uh, how wonderful this is. Um, so, this is how it's presented on DVD. Yeah, good. And uh, this is her desktop, okay? Her actual desktop, where she did the study. And if you drag the cursor over different bits, Let's try this one, the highlight. That's a notebook. And uh, you can show this. This is how she kind of worked on the archives. This is, called, this is all her notey bits. And she's included them as process in the thesis itself. OK? If we go to this bit, these brown folders. These are 12 folders of collected and translated stories, some of which have sound attached to them, where she's talking about it in Spanish or English. Okay? Those are the stories that she collected. Uh, let's just go back. Uh, let's go here. What's this? I can't even remember what this one is. <coughs> Oh, that's the instructions for opening the CD roll. <laughs> yep, yeah, okay. That's very straightforward. Uh, here's um, the, what's this? Oh, yeah, this is nice. Photographs from the collection. That's the author. She researched Lydia Cabrera. Uh, fantastic collection of photographs from uh, Cuba. Very funny one there, two people fixing the car. There she is collecting stories in the field, as it were. Uh, her notebooks. It, you can see there's a vision, the amount of work that behind putting this CD on together is huge. And there's lots, lots more there. And two more things to show you. Uh, well, here's her computer on her desk. Let's click on that and see what we get. I don't want to say what it is until we get to it. Hopefully, I can. Okay. okay, if it doesn't, what is here on the computer is the entire conventional thesis. You just click on it, and it's, it's what you know, I did in my, my boring 1990s way. She's got the whole thesis on it. So, this is all, as it were, extra to it and forms the bigger one. And here, oh, sorry, it's kind of a I'm trying to open that. And this little post it is her acknowledgements. <laughs> and she just thanks people who put it. But that, and, and these are some of the books she used in her literature review. So, I mean, what, what she could go further, couldn't she? Make each one of these live with a critical summary 
uh, how did you do could have done in that way. It's a brilliant, uh, typical new university solution to uh, presenting thesis. Okay. I just want to say thank you to Richard to yeah. start off with. So I think we should give you a quick round of applause.